Atmosphere is a hard thing to get right in a video game. It can make or break how immersed you find yourself in that experience, and ultimately dictate the nostalgia of that experience when looking back in retrospect. I would say there are even games that exist with amazing atmosphere, but lack refinement in other cases, whether it was due to the fact that it's the first of its kind in a series, or just because the gameplay didn't need to be insanely deep. In From Software's games, atmosphere is a key detail that they almost always get right. I know that the views on what makes up the overall vibe of something can be extremely subjective, so keep this in mind. This is my personal view over the years of heavily investing time into Demon Souls, the Dark Souls trilogy, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring. I would argue that the reason I can even play some of these games casually or with modded challenges is purely due to the foundation that the game establishes, making the atmosphere an important backbone in everything coming together. Before you watch the whole video, comment below which Soulsborne game had the best atmosphere in your personal opinion, and let's see if it matches up with mine. Also, don't forget to hit the notification bell and subscribe as well for future videos. The order we're gonna go is from the weakest to the strongest atmosphere out of all the games previously mentioned. We're going to focus on three major key points of design, including what dictates a great atmosphere in a game. The first and most important is the world itself, comprised of the character models, lighting systems, landscapes, assets, and items. The second detail is the journey through the world and flow of general gameplay. The final detail is how the soundtrack emphasizes the mood of different situations, whether it's overall areas or even boss fights. Without further ado, let's kick it off with Dark Souls 2. The Dark Souls 2 gameplay at E3 2013 was looking to be a genuine improvement upon the first game in the aspects of graphical fidelity and mood. The gameplay had cool features that were not present in the previous Dark Souls game, like lighting torches to traverse dark areas where otherwise you wouldn't be able to see. You were also able to power stance weapons by holding the two-hand button, combining the moveset of applicable weapons into a more powerful combination. One of the most interesting things to me personally was the fact that you could deflect flying projectiles by swinging large weapons like the Ultra Great Sword, deflecting them back at the enemies. Unfortunately, when the final game released, it did not live up to expectations. Apparently, the hardware demonstrating the original E3 footage wasn't able to keep up with rendering the final game, with the same visuals and some of the features being cut in the end. What we end up with is a game that, aside from the action RPG elements and general purpose, doesn't live up to the original promise. It lost the grittiness that gave the original Dark Souls its style, and on top of that, most importantly, the world design. The areas seem a lot less vertically imposed and even less dense at times. Whereas Dark Souls 1 felt like a never-ending maze of areas intelligently intertwined to make seamless transitions that end up progressing you from humble beginnings, like the Undead Burg, all the way to mysterious areas like Demon Ruins and Crystal Cave. The contrast between these areas can be massively different, but the way that you reach them just makes sense. In Dark Souls 2, one of the weirdest things I remembered is in the Shrine of Winter, running through the forest, and then all of a sudden after a short tunnel, it's all of a sudden dark and raining and the castle's aesthetic is such a far departure from where we just were in the game. This also happens with transitions, like the one in Huntsman's Copse into Earthern Peak, then Earthern Peak to Iron Keep. It kind of seems like someone just glued random places together and called it a day. Even the depth of these areas alone falls flat and barely holds up to even the earliest places you can reach in the other games. I should mention at this point that From Software's B team worked on the game under the direction of Tanamura but Miyazaki, the previous director of the other games, was simply just overseeing the project. They tried a lot of different things, and it worked for the most part in some ways, but because of several inconsistencies, the atmosphere just seemed dull. The downloadable content like Shelva Sanctum City, Broom Tower, and Elium Lois brought back a lot of that intricate and deep Dark Souls 1 experience. In my opinion, they displayed very consistent designs that flowed very well into each other over a large amount of space. This helped, but even the soundtrack in the second Dark Souls game was not nearly as memorable on boss fights specifically. At the end of the game, the thing that stood out the most musically for me was Majula.
Second up on the list is Demon Souls. This may be a controversial placing for the game, and while there was a remake of the game released for PS5, improving the graphical detail and lighting a ton, the base gameplay is mainly what held the game back. Unfortunately, this was unchanged in the re-release, and people were very disappointed about that. But from what I understand, Bluepoint was not tasked with redoing the gameplay elements as much as just visuals. If Bluepoint was actually allowed to do a lot more with the game, it's obvious that this would rank a lot higher on this list. The areas in Demon's Souls are immediately realized as the centerpiece of the game. While controlling the character, even in just basic ways, can be quite challenging, the flow of how you explore the world is magnificent and still is, in my opinion, some of the best world design we have ever seen in a game of this genre. It feels like the conflict that plagued Boletaria actually happened, and you are discovering and participating in its aftermath as you spiral deeper. One thing differing with Boletaria is that you access the areas through a hub called the Nexus, meaning that the world is disconnected. Even the Nexus in the original is beautiful, and it's actually quite massive for its purpose of navigation. Baltarian Palace feels like a fallen kingdom. Stonefang Tunnel, though concealing most of its secrets in cave systems deep within the rock face, reminds me of an ancient place where we could take inspiration from the real world, where civilization made operations to mine resources and elaborate systems to extract and transport the materials intelligently. Tower of Latria's prison not only is a tricky place to navigate, but it was actually a mental prison of mine while attempting to progress on my first playthrough. The maze-like corridors winding into multiple floors where you must obtain certain keys with a dark setting layered on top of genuinely hard gameplay had me stuck for days. When you leave the prison, you realize there's a much more sinister thing happening high above the lower levels where the prisoners are held. The gargoyles bringing you up above the system of towers with the big bridges chained together gives you the sensation that you actually are ascending as you play. Shrine of Storms, while annoying with the skeletons, is a mystical place of worship to the Shadow Men who call upon the old hero to protect their grave. And the Valley of Defilement truly lives up to its own name, throwing you into a spiteful swamp of decay and poison. I don't know if anybody enjoyed this area, but I think it's ultimately what the goal was. Not from its poor design, but because they made it so well with the goal for it to feel miserable. The soundtrack in Demon's Souls is not the most advanced and almost funny with its trumpets duding away as you fight giant foes like Tower Knight. On the contrary, the character creation music and the Nexus theme share this ethereal and floating feeling that brings you to a place of ease and tension at the same time. It's one of the coolest but simplest tunes in most games I've played. Moving on to Dark Souls 3. A game that offers such a huge improvement in gameplay over the first and second titles to the point where they could ramp up the complexity of the enemy design and movesets in combat without it feeling nearly as janky as it used to. This new sense of capability breeds so much more thirst for adventure, and the areas do flow decently throughout the world. Some of the ideas are really awesome and will be very memorable for a lot of us in the future. Though it did lose the level of interconnectivity that you'll find with shortcuts and surprises in Demon Souls and the first Dark Souls, it does offer enemies that fit the areas well that they inhabit, and you can feel that places are as they should be every time you find a new area. Now I will say despite this, the game is almost a weird middle ground of the washed looking nature of Dark Souls 2, and the contrasting grittiness of the first title. I mainly didn't feel the vibes as strongly from the world and the flow, but I did from the soundtrack. This is arguably the coolest soundtrack of the Dark Souls trilogy, with almost every single song hitting hard and adding to the scenario a ton. Even when you start the game, the title screen's music alone insinuates something epic is about to unfold. and with the most advanced boss designs in combat at the time, it pulls through overall. I love how the Ring City DLC included a massive descent and an optional swamp with plenty of smaller pockets of unique enemies, amazing items, and other things to add to your existing playthrough. 
The Ring City really felt like the end of the world, and when you fall into the pit kicking off the first boss fight against Demon Prince, only to realize after closer investigation that it's actually Firelink Shrine, well, that's a really cool detail that wasn't even necessary, but much appreciated. Archdragon Peak is another place that, while separated from the main game, felt like an expedition to uncover history. There's even Ornstein's armor set from the first game resting directly after you kill Nameless King. To end off the trilogy portion of the video is none other than the original Dark Souls. No matter the remaster or OG, this title holds up in every way I can talk about either way. I'd say its charm still even remains on PS3 and Xbox 360 versions, despite the limited power of the hardware and seemingly terrible frame rate in certain areas like Blighttown. Let's start off with the aforementioned, like the contrast between the Berg, Demon Ruins, and Crystal Cave, to name a few. They do an amazing job at bridging the gap between, and as you go further you find yourself making it back to places you've seen before, but from other areas. It's this detail alone on a first playthrough that gives you a priceless sense of discovery and genuine surprise. There's also a lot of well thought out ambush moments, and places that can go from 0 to 100 real quick, requiring you to figure out a strategy other than brute forcing your way through, which is more reminiscent of Demon Souls. The Fanged Boar is a great example upon entering the gate that borders the Hellkite Bridge. You can take the stairs up around the boar and throw an alluring skull into the fire burning in the corner and damage it as you escape. This little environmental engagement almost feels like a true mini-boss to a first player. Alternatively, if you don't take the staircase, the boar will just pile drive you over and over until you learn how to do something different, almost gatekeeping the situation. Other things related to this are the Black Knight guarding the blue tearstone ring in the undead burg near Taurus Demon. The Titanite Demon guarding the path to Andre from Darkroot Forest. The Hydra residing in Darkroot Basin. And the Taurus Demons guarding the Demon Fire Sage. Moments like this made the enemies feel like true gatekeepers because all of them are protecting some form of progression or alternate pathway. They have more authority than regular enemies, and this is something I didn't feel at all from Dark Souls 2. And this was kind of resolved in the DLC, but not too much. The soundtrack of the first Dark Souls is an improvement upon Demon Souls and Dark Souls 2, with tunes like Sif the Great Great Wolf. Artorius of the Abyss. And Gwyn the Lord of Cinder. In fact, my guitar adaptation of Plin Plin Plon is still the most successful video I've ever recorded playing guitar, accruing more attention over arguably famous bands like Polyphia. This alone speaks to how memorable the score is and solidifies it as the official go-to soundtrack of anything Dark Souls. They even brought it back in the Soul of Cinder fight at the end of Dark Souls 3. Next up on the list is the game that we consider a sibling of Souls without actually being the same thing. In my experience, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice shines the brightest if we were looking from the standpoint of pure gameplay alone, but additionally has a great storyline, set main character, and world that resembles post-Edo Japan to add to the experience. I will admit, for me personally, this does help its case a lot, because you develop a connection to the characters, keeping you involved more than other NPCs in the Souls universe. This is partially due to the fact that your role as Wolf actually has clear duty demonstrated every time he interacts with Kuro. His battle between the man that raised him and potentially saved him as a child in a war-ridden landscape feels like a deeper betrayal than adversaries from the past, and the history between the characters like Lady Butterfly, Ishin, and Genichiro just complete this picture of a place that could be real. I felt like Sekiro was a movie that I had never seen, and I was playing the main character through all the scenarios that would unfold if historically accurate samurai battles met with a twist of dark fantasy were dreamt up by the likes of a great author. Of course you can say that there's a ton of things that are unrealistic, but the game has a vibe that's in a league of its own. The areas, while not laid out intricately and nearly as intertwined like the original Dark Souls, still gives you plenty of believability and consistency across the kingdom. Its soundtrack, according to FromSoft, was crafted with cultural sounds in mind, 
and incorporated some new instruments, making the approach to its production a new challenge for Yuka Kitamura. This added some of the most value for me. I absolutely love how much the soundtrack stands out while still sounding grandiose in its own regard. When I first booted up the game, I got spine chills as the main theme started to progress. The graphics in Sekiro were arguably the best that FromSoft had done at the time, and used some new tricks that built on the existing architecture which they built the previous games in. Zipping around with the grapple and using different prosthetic tools in certain situations created moments that were so epic that I'll always have to go back and do a casual playthrough. One notable moment was the kill that you get on Guardian Ape upon using the prosthetic spear to remove the centipede that controlled its body. We're now entering the top tier of atmosphere, but the next two games featured are placed in their respective rankings for slightly different reasons. Elden Ring, the newest title that's released in the subgenre of Souls, is a behemoth when we take a look at the world design. It's easy to say that open areas are not as appreciated as the interconnected dungeon-esque nature of the past titles, but when you realize that FromSoft has never made a game like this before and managed to make horseback travel across the plains between, and that they wrap that around the legacy dungeon designs that are reminiscent of the previous games, as well as mini dungeons and extras like Everjails, churches, and forts to raid, well, it's really impressive with that in mind. George R. R. Martin also did the game so much good by writing the story, and I actually liked it better than any previous story that they had done. I was most certainly not expecting this to be the case before the game released, but it really does feel like a place of its own personality and history. The legacy dungeon designs are really cool, and perfect for how the overworld is layered out around them. And the way you discover NPCs almost feels more rare than other games because of how big it is upon the first playthrough. I found the characters all well-voiced and having great personalities for their roles in the main character's progression. Like Sekiro, they added ambient music in areas where you're outside boss fights, but upon encountering a boss, things turn up a lot. The main theme was instantly on par with my other favorites, and the callback to it in Radagon was just the icing on the cake. There are hundreds of boss fights, so while I do think the music is great, I can't quite say that it's comparable to the more intimate list of songs that they have previously. Some of them aren't nearly as memorable as others, and that follows the notion that they're just jammed into a whole lot of content. I found that the way you explore has that same kind of quality where you get lost in an open world game, but still kept that same brutality and combat of the Souls titles. For someone like me that doesn't really like open world games, but has played some like Skyrim, Fallout, and a couple others, this became one of my favorites, period. Alright guys, if you made it this far in the video without skipping ahead, I can't say thank you enough. This video has been in the works for a long time, and I'm super excited to share my thoughts on the subject. The kingpin of the tier list for best atmosphere in a Soulsborne game is Bloodborne. From the moment I saw the demo of Central Yarnum leading up to Cleric Beast, I knew the game was going to slap so hard. There was a secret way to access Father Gascoigne by doing a glitch in the sewers in the demo, and after seeing a clip of it, I was not only hyped for what looked like a deeper level of challenge with the combat, but also the mood of Bloodborne was nothing like I had seen before. When the full game released, I actually almost fell asleep playing 15 hours straight, and could probably have gone even longer off of pure vibes alone. It was just so damn cool. The gothic Victorian aesthetic, the night of the hunt, and the mystery of the blood transfusions was constantly running through my mind, and I still think about the backstory from time to time to this day. Bloodborne's lore is like a layer cake of dreams resembling a structure that reminds me of Inception. It has so much complexity, yet the way it delivers it is the best twist I've experienced playing a video game. It starts off with central Yarnum and the cityscape spiraling into a deep, almost biblical Cthulhuan mythos nature. The mystery of the Great Ones, the obsession with insight, and the eventual transcendence of yourself in the Blood Moon ending is unlike anything I've ever seen. I had read H.P. Lovecraft previously, and I can see heavy inspiration, but in terms of overall fidelity of the game, I can't find a single point where Bloodborne goes wrong. The soundtrack is also next to Skyrim, my favorite OST of all time. 
The main menu's music vocals are beautiful and dark at the same time. My cheesy title for it would be Elegant Pain. The boss music is almost permanently burned into my mind, front to back, after having only a third of the hours compared to my most played game, which would be Dark Souls 3. This is an opinion, but I feel like it's almost kind of objective at the same time. My favorite moment that cements the cool factor of its atmosphere is when Ludwig the Accursed finds his guiding moonlight and the violins of the intro tune progress into the symphony of horns and melodies that perfectly outline the legacy of Ludwig's character. Of course, as a video game, it's a close favorite next to Sekiro and Elden Ring due to mostly the gameplay and flexibility in the other titles. But for what it is, being a hunter in Yharnam is an experience that every action RPG fan needs to experience. Out of all the comparison videos I've ever made, ranking Soulsborne titles based on atmosphere has been the most nostalgic video I've written in a long time. It brought me back through memory lane, and even though you may disagree as the audience in the comments, I hope it reminded you of your first impressions exploring these amazing worlds. If you want more content like this, let me know what to talk about next. And as always, make sure you're subscribed, notified, and check out the links in the pinned comment for my other social media platforms. As always, be well, and I'll see you next time.